we're going to uh, start our 2024 annual meeting. Um, so thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, just before we begin, we just want to take a moment to remember and appreciate our friend and colleague, Barbara Howland. Um, she was an extremely dedicated volunteer who served as president of our board from 2019 until her life was cut short in July 2023, shortly following her cancer diagnosis. And this beautiful photo shows Barbara really in her element. She's pictured in the center of the photo and she's surrounded by volunteers. She always helped rally and recruit them by jumping in herself to take on any task at hand. And she will be greatly, greatly missed. But as a tribute to her, we'd like to start the meeting as she always did with a quote from a client or agency. Barbara did this because she felt it was really important to always turn our focus um, as the household goods community to the reason why we do what we do. And that's our clients and helping people make a home. So here's a recent letter. Uh, Dear Household Goods, my name is Minerva Bullduck and I serve as the advocacy manager at Women's Lunch Place. I'm ready to express our deepest gratitude to you and your organization, Household Goods, for the invaluable support you provided to one of our clients, Susan. Susan is a remarkable woman who has faced unimaginable hardships. She came to Women's Lunch Place after enduring more than two years of sleeping in her car, enduring extreme weather conditions during both scorching summers and freezing winters. Her journey to find safe and stable housing was fraught with challenges, particularly due to her history of fleeing domestic violence. Susan's determination to secure permanent housing led her to apply to numerous housing developments throughout Massachusetts. Unfortunately, she encountered repeated denials due to a lack of proof of homelessness. It was at this juncture that Women's Lunch Place stepped in to advocate on her behalf. We issued a letter affirming her homelessness status, which was instrumental in securing her a beautiful apartment in Chelsea. Upon moving into her new home, Susan initially only had an air mattress for comfort. It was at this point that we referred her to household goods and the transformation has been nothing short of remarkable. Thanks to your generous support, Susan's entire apartment was furnished, significantly improving her quality of life and providing her with the warmth and comfort she deserves. I'd like to extend my heartfelt appreciation to the dedicated volunteers who work tirelessly at Household Goods. Their hard work and commitment have undoubtedly made a profound impact on individuals like Susan. Your organization's patience and dedication to serving those in need do not go unnoticed or unappreciated. Attached to this letter is a photograph, which we're showing here, showcasing a part of the furniture that Susan received from Household Goods. Your generosity has made a tangible difference in her life, and for that, we are eternally grateful. In closing, I want to convey our sincerest thanks and blessings to everyone at Household Goods. Your unwavering support and kindness have touched the life of Susan and, by extension, the lives of all those we strive to serve at Women's Lunch Place. Your mission to provide furniture to those in need aligns perfectly with our vision of creating a safer, more comfortable world for vulnerable individuals. Once again, thank you for your compassion, dedication, and invaluable assistance. May your organization continue to thrive, bringing comfort and hope to countless others in need. In need, sorry. With warm regards, Minerva Bolduck, Advocacy Manager, Women's Lunch Place. So we hope you all enjoyed that. It was a, it was a little long hearing me talk, but um, we really appreciated her sending us this. And it always really helps to be have, have letters like this to to share with people so they really understand the impact of, of what we're all trying to do. And with that, we're gonna to need to have a short business meeting before our panel discussion. And so I'm gonna introduce our clerk, clerk, John Fallon, for a motion on the minutes of the 2023 annual meeting. John? Uh, I move we approve the minutes of the 2023 annual meeting. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. So moved. Thank you, John. And then the next order of business is approving our proposed slate of officers and directors, which our Vice President Bridget Bieber will present. Bridget? Thank you, Mimi. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for attending the meeting. Um, we have two things to uh, ask for your approval on tonight. The first is going to be the election of the officers of household goods. Um, you'll find everything that's being voted on, uh, or being asked to be voted on is underlined on this slide. So Mimi Deck Rutledge has agreed to continue on as president. Um, I've been nominated as vice president. 
Priscilla Gannon will continue on as treasurer and John Fallon as our clerk. Uh, according to the bylaws of the organization, each officer position is for a term of one year. So we're looking for approval for the slate of officers uh, for the year ended March, 2025. So we're looking for a motion to approve the slate of officers tonight. So moved. A second. Thank you. I Thank second. You. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Th thank you. The second item on this uh, slide is the election of directors of the organization. Um, as you probably know, we have uh, 16 directors currently um, on this on the slate of uh, directors. Half of those have a two year term that ends in 2026. And the other half had a term that ended in, Mar in um, March of 2024. So only the off only the directors with the terms that ended this March are being put up for re-election. And uh, as you'll see, all of them will be, um, have a term ending in 2026, except for um, me. Um, I will have a director's term that ends in 2025. And the reason for that is, even though most of our, our directors by, our, by terms of our bylaws are elected for a two year term, we also have 50% uh, that need to be staggered. Um, every other year. So um, I will have a one year term and that will make it even for those that are expiring in 2025 and 2026. So uh, Susan Arapoff, Mary Bassett, Mike Broderick, uh, mm -hmm. Mike Kotu, Mike Kotu um, Steve DeSantis, Janet Glidden and um, Audrey are up for election um, this year um, as well as uh, I am um, and Priscilla Gannon. So can I have a motion to approve those individuals as directors for the terms on this slide? So moved. Second. Second. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Terrific. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That is that. Is that. Um, and the final part of our meeting is just, um, I'd like to introduce our uh, executive director, Sharon Martins, just to uh, share a brief review of 2023 at Household Goods. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you, Bridget and John. Um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight and for supporting Household Goods. 2023 was a record-breaking year for us. We saw more people coming to us for help than ever before. We furnished 2,000, 870 homes for 8,000 people. That represents an 18% increase over the number of homes we furnished in 2022. And so far in the first two months of this year, we have seen a 25% increase in the number of families coming to us for help compared to the same time last year. We are able to meet this need because of your support and the larger community of people and businesses who support household goods. We continue to hear about the housing crisis in the news on an almost daily basis. What we don't hear is that when people finally get housing, that housing <laughs> is most often empty. Yeah. Unfurnished, for people who have been living in their car or at a shelter, or who left everything behind to leave an abusive relationship, or for many who are living in Massachusetts, working hard and making minimum wage, furnishing an apartment can be impossible even on the second-hand market. And that's where household good com goods comes in. Since our founders, Barb and Iris Smith, helped the very first family in 1990, household goods has provided over 950,000 items, large and small. This year, we are on track to provide our one millionth item. One million items going to homes where people need them. One million items provided by people like you who made the effort to donate with the intention of helping someone in need experience dignity and hope. I cannot express the gratitude of our agencies and clients for everyone who has made an impact, whether it's donating good quality items, volunteering their time, or making a financial donation. As we expect to furnish even more homes this year, I ask you all to please not keep household goods a secret. Help us spread the word so we will have enough furniture and household items to provide to the increasing number of clients we are serving 
So we will have enough volunteers to make it all possible. And so we will have enough funding to keep us going strong. Tonight, you will hear from three of our referring agencies who will share with you the struggles they see every day with the people they help and the impact having a furnished home has on their lives. Thank you all again for being here. And I will now turn it back over to Mimi Rutledge who will moderate the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Sharon. And I would be very remiss in not giving a huge shout out to uh, Sharon and the rest of our invaluable staff, Kirsten Spargo, Marilyn Kaplan, Mike Liuzzo, and Leon Rosek. These five people are dedicated to supporting the 1,500 volunteers who gave 51,000 hours of their time in 2023 to make the enterprise run smoothly day after day. So kudos to our wonderful staff for all they do. Thank you. So now we're gonna to turn to our panel discussion and I have a very brief intro here um, so people can understand what the relationship between our agencies and household goods and our clients is. So every client that comes to household goods has first connected with a social service organization to ask for help. For our purposes, the social service organization is a broad term. It encompasses hundreds of faith communities, schools, as well as places like the VA, hospitals, Pine Street Inn, DCF, and many, many, many more, hundreds in fact. And now these organizations all work in different ways to help people navigate whatever individual crisis or challenge they might be facing. It could be homelessness, domestic violence, a fire, a medical crisis, job loss, the list goes on and on. People working at these agencies are the, agencies are the ones most familiar with their client's circumstances. And when they identify a lack of furniture in their client's living situation, they'll then refer that client to household goods. So that's how it works. We're fortunate to have representatives from three of our referring agencies here tonight. We have Amanda Eldridge from the Acton Housing Authority, Louisa Fernandez from the Fitchburg Public Schools, and Peter Namakawa from, Namakawa from Reach Beyond Domestic Violence. Uh, during the discussion, please feel free to put any questions you may have in the chat or raise your hand during the Q&A we'll have immediately afterwards. So Amanda, Peter, and Louisa, as I introduce you, please tell us about your role where you work and the people you serve. And we'll take it from there. Amanda? Hi, so my name is Amanda Eldridge. I work at the Acton Housing Authority. Um, I do resident services. So I provide um, social service supports to our clients. Um, and um, our clients are coming in on different housing programs. Many live in Acton, some do not. Um, and, um, that's basically, um, my role there is to, to provide additional support once they get housing with us. Perfect. And, uh, Louisa. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Luisa. As Ms. Mimi mentioned, I work for Future Public Schools and the Family and Community Engagement Coordinator. So uh, my office runs as a small resource center for the community. I just I don't work just with the families in the school. I try to, you know, help as much as we can. Uh, my superintendent is very open to the idea to just we never say no, you know, we help everyone. So um, my role in the school is basically to connect families with resources. Uh, I have a great relationship with the city, with all, all, almost every single agency that work at Fitchburg or is uh, providing services in Fitchburg. So, you know, I, I make those connections and um, uh, that's our goal, just to make a family's life easier, better. And right now, uh, Fitchburg become a very diverse place. We have peoples from around the world. It's very beautiful. So, you know, we we, we try to welcome those newcomers and try to, 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 to provide them with the information that they need about our city, you know, programs, activities for the kids. So that's what I do. Oh, thank you. And uh, Peter? Yeah, good evening and thank you for having me here today. I am Peter Namukoa and I'm a community advocate at Reach Beyond Domestic Violence. Our agency is located in Waltham. 
And at Reach Beyond Domestic Violence, we work with survivors of domestic violence. And our agency provides advocacy services uh, for resources like housing, uh, health, water accompaniment, and emotional support. We also uh, run support groups. Uh, we have two cycles that are running this time. And through that, that is how we get to interact with the different families that have been beneficiaries of household goods. So um, thank you. That's terrific. Thank you everyone for introducing yourselves. Um, my first question is, what are some of the biggest uh, challenges that your clients uh, face that you see on a daily basis? Peter, I'll start with you. Peter? Yeah, uh, so our clients, is, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think most of, they face a number of challenges, but the most challenging are housing and navigating systems. And that is when we come in because when we work with survivors, they are interacting with the court systems, law enforcement, they are dealing with the healthcare system and you know all the different resources that you know are available out there. But sometimes finding housing is the most complex because when we talk about housing, people think it's all about having walls and a roof on top of your head. But it's one thing to have those two, but what makes it a home, I think is the most challenging. So, and that is where household good comes in. You know? Oh, thank you. Um, uh, Louisa, what kind of challenges do you see out there for your oh, We're gonna spend here all night. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, as Peter, you know, um, homelessness is definitely a very big issue here in my community. Um, you know, undocumented families are really struggling because they don't have access to a lot of their resources, you know. Um, I mean, with that say, you know, there is a lot of support, yes, but you know, you don't have that you don't have the easy access to food stamps or, you know, that, that kind of resources that are very helpful during this hard time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, housing, they cannot apply for housing. So it's, it's tough, it's tough. Um, the other problem or or, or one of the, 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 the hard things uh, for me is to identify families as well. Uh, you know, because sometimes they feel embarrassed, uh, they feel scared about to get in trouble if they tell us that they are, you know, sleeping in their cars. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm working very hard into like create those relationships with families so they can trust me. So so I can help them and serve better, you know, to them. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have a lot of families in our district without insurance, medical insurance, because they are not aware um, uh, the ways to get it. So um, that's why um, I put together um, a resource guide for my community so families can navigate better the system, family uh, can find their resources, and actually household goods is over there. So uh, while we are here, I'm going to share in the chat for the people that is here tonight that is from Leminster or Feature area. There is a bunch of resources over there that they can share with families in need. Well, that's terrific. Thank you. Uh, Amanda, can you tell us a little bit about what the process is to find housing and how long it takes for people that you're working with? It's a really, really daunting um, task is the truth. Um, it's it's not only just tough to navigate it, but then once you figure out how to apply and get on those lists, it's a long, long wait. So um, I would say, you know, the thing is, is the first the first good step for anyone is always to reach out if they're able to or have someone they know reach out to a local housing authority and find out what their programs are and get on those wait lists. There are also affordable options outside of housing authorities, and that's where it can get a little tricky. Um, so it's really important that social workers or, you know, in schools or towns have resources on their list to share where they can go that for that information or help them get on lists. Um, the state also has introduced some websites that are navigator sites um, for helping people find affordable housing. 
So they are trying, but just as an example, right now, just for the CHAMP application, which is state public housing, we currently have 30,000 people on our wait list, on the Acton wait list. They can be on as many other towns in the state as they want. So I would say about, mm, let me see, from the wait list this morning, it's probably about at least 12,000 families in um, 5,000 or so elderly and disabled people. And then there's a voucher program that have some of the other on that wait list. So it's just, it's, it's really daunting, but I always tell people, you know, we tell people it's so important to get on that list, especially in emergency situations, things can move more quickly, um, veterans. Um, but it's, as we all know, we're in a housing crisis. And so even individuals or families that were at one time considered moderate income and would be able to afford rent or an inexpensive home. That's not the case right now. So that's why the wait lists are growing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's tricky. It's very tough. Mm -hmm. So we always make sure to give people, you know, something to hand out when they come and we make sure they're on the list they're eligible for, but they at least walk away with maybe other options that are going to serve them more quickly because our wait for an emergency is probably one to two years um, and five to seven for someone who's probably not. So it's really tough. That sounds like an incredibly difficult challenge. When It is. When, when you find, um, I'll ask Peter this, when you finally get people into housing, can you describe a little bit like what a typical apartment might look like that would finally be available to these people? Sure. So, I mean, the good thing is, is obviously this is a, you know, housing authorities are state agencies. So everything is, you know, by the code. Um, so it's going to be, um, you know, obviously decent, safe housing um, inspections have to take place. So no one's going to go into a, be approved to live in a substandard unit. Um, for seniors and disabled individuals that have been approved, they get one bedroom apartments. Um, families, we have um, mostly two bedroom apartments. That's a growing issue now. Um, a lot of housing authorities need more three bedroom and four bedroom properties. So in Acton, I believe we have three three bedroom properties and one four bedroom property, but otherwise all of our family properties are two bedroom. Um, so they would be small, you know. Yeah. So regardless of family size, that's that's what is available and they have to figure out how to make that work. There are rules, we, can, we, we have to place the family in the appropriate, um, apartment size. So if you're a, you know, a much, much larger family, it will be difficult if there's not a lot of stock with more bedrooms. Mm -hmm. So there's rules about, you know, how many years apart they have to be, if they're different genders, the children, things like that. Thank you. And um, Peter, when you're, when you finally, again, when you finally get to this point where you find an apartment for someone, when they walk in, what is it? What is it like? And I'm, I'm assuming it's typically unfurnished. Yeah, and it depends on the circumstances. There are some people who have some properties, like someone may have an air mattress and a few belongings that they have in their possession. Like they became homeless, but some are forced to pay for hotels or find shelters where they can stay as they still try to find items for furnishing these apartments. Because like I said, it is one thing to get the apartment, but you also have to make it feel like home. And so sometimes if it doesn't feel like home, you know, it is not habitable. So normally what we do, we find a place where they can live for a while. And then through the resources that we have in our communities, you know, we reach out to try to find some things that they can put to use. And in most cases, some will tell you if I just get a bed and maybe something that I can use for preparing meals, that will be a good starting point. But still, even with that, especially when there are children involved, because in most cases, some of these survivors we work with have children and DCF is also involved. And you know how DCF is very strict about what an environment that is favorable yeah. for children would look like. And so to protect them from getting into more, 
no trouble with DCF. You'd rather have them in a shelter or a hotel or somewhere as you try to find resources for furnishing the apartment. So they need a furnished apartment before DCF will release their children to them. Is that the how typically? In most cases, yes. Um, and so, yes. what 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 would you typically need in an apartment to be to satisfy DCF's sort of requirements? What kinds of items? So, so one of them I think has been mentioned: the number of bedrooms, mm -hmm. depending on the number of children you have, and a bedroom qualifies when it also has a window, mm -hmm. but. Depending on the age groups, each child is supposed to at least have a bed. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to have running utilities. And then in terms of furniture and play area, you're supposed to have items that are deemed safe for the environment where children are supposed to, you know, like mm -hmm. play and run around. Mm -hmm. For example, if an officer came into a home and you had a table and maybe one of the limbs is, you know, like either broken or at the verge of breaking, that is considered a risk for a child because you know how children are very active. And mm -hmm. so sometimes when some of those things are in place, it makes it very difficult because DCF mostly does unannounced visits. They always just show up. They want to look at your kitchen. What does it look like? Is it clean? Do you have mm -hmm. all the food that is required for the child to survive? If you don't, they also look at probably the dishes you have like because there are certain things that portray what uh, good living standards look like. So mm -hmm. if they spawn you with three or four children and you only have two plates, you know, it says a lot. So in most cases, we try very hard to utilize resources like you to ensure that we set up uh, an environment where even if a worker showed up anytime, they would at least know that this family is doing well and they have the appliances they need like to put to use for the welfare of themselves and the children that they take care of. That's so important for us to all hear that because it really gives us a picture of what you're dealing with that I don't think we'd really have had that, that insight before. I know that we're, in the last couple of years, we've um, made sure that any, any heavy furniture has an anti-tip anchor available. And so we're thinking about that safety and all, all of our volunteers are always thinking about providing safe, you know, um, uh, providing safe items for our, all of our clients, but that this makes it even more poignant that that's such a that's such an interesting uh, such an important issue for all of us. So thank you for sharing that, Louisa. Are you seeing the same kinds of things? What what's an apartment look like when you walk into it for a family that you're trying to help? Well, my my case is a little bit different um, here in Fitchburg. You know, uh, the majority of the clients that I, I referred to your program are victims of fire. Mm -hmm. So we have fires here in the city, like be, at the beginning of the of the of the winter, we always have like three or four every year. And by the summer we have again like three or four big fires. So every time that I have a family victim of a fire is the family that I send over there. But yeah, the circumstances are, are very similar. Um, you know, um I, I work with a lot of families that, you know, finally through raft, you know, get, get an apartment and, you know, and they need furniture. So, you know, this program is perfect. Uh, actually, I, when, she, when you were talking, I was thinking, you know, when I decide, I'm going to share a little bit about my, about my story, when I decide to stay because we came for vacation and we never left uh, mm -hmm. because the situation in my country was worse and worse and worse. So, um. I remember that I was doubling up with my sister. I was homeless with my husband and my tickets. We, we were like in a little tiny corner of my sister house. And I was so happy because my sister neighbor passed. <laughs> and oh. like I got all her furniture. So, but I just struggle because I have just like a little tiny table. I have like a few like forks and, you know, some pens. But I was so happy because finally my house was having like it started to feel it like home. But now we, when I discovered this resource, I was like, oh my God, this is perfect. You know, now nobody needs to wait for someone to die to get, you know, furniture. Like, and I'm very happy for what you are doing. This is awesome. And yeah, but to, to answer your question, yes, it's, it's, it's very similar. It's just that, you know, I work with families that have like this type of accidents, like floating or, or, or fires. And you had mentioned, I think, when we were in our agency advisory meeting that um, it, it makes a difference for kids when they come to school. 
um, that they had they they have, they were hadn't been in a furnished apartment, but then they start coming to school again with smiles on their faces. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Of course. So uh, you know, uh, as as I mentioned, the the housing situation well, you know, just not here, like everywhere in the United States, um, is 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 very rough, and you know. Um, we we have kids that come to school very tired because they don't have a bed to sleep in because and and you know like i think even you know everybody knows what what a house look like you know and the kids know when their home doesn't look like a home because they don't have like a, like a, a chair or they don't have a table so um yeah like i i i remember that we refer to a specific family this family went through hell it was very very bad like um they found themselves look at like sleeping in a car for like 3 weeks uh, I have a good friend that like, you know, was running the, the shelters, but the shelters were full. So they let this family to, to go in the shelter just to take showers and, and eat, but he didn't have any free space for them. So, um, they apply for, for shelter and they found a shelter like two hours away from Fitchburg. So I lost the, those four kids. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, things happen. She applied, she, she followed the process and she found housing here in Fitchburg. So I refer her to the program and, you know, the so the kids look very tired the first couple of weeks because one more time they didn't have a bed, they didn't have anything. And one of the days, the, the girl told me, I had the best night ever. I slept mm -hmm. in my bed. It was wonderful. And she's like, you need to come to my place. I have a, I have now a couch and I have a beautiful table. So, you know, those stories are beautiful. And, and, and you know, that, that I think those kids are going to have hopes. Those kids are going to keep dreaming. And those kids are going to, are, they, they are going to know that there are opportunities for them out there, you know, that, that this, the, the, the resources are, are, are here for them. So it was, it, yeah, you, you can tell when a kid is sleeping, have a good sleep night be, and they're going to be ready for learning, ready, you know, for deal with their, their, their school day and learn. Right. So, yeah, that's very that's nice. Important here. Thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, do Amanda, do you have a, um, a a story or an anecdote or something you'd like to share with us about your experience with household goods? Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, it's just um, such a wonderful referral to always be able to make um, because there really is no competition, so to speak, and no other options, I would say. Um, but yeah, the story I always think of is um, this one family I've been working with for, I guess, almost eight years now since I started. And it's a single mother um, with two kids uh, in Acton. And uh, I had helped her with so many things, but most of the things that she came to me for help with were for the kids, you know, camps, activities, helping for cost to drive her ed for her da teenage daughter, things like that. And um and so in all those years, she had never mentioned to me, I found out later from another local agency that was helping her that she had an empty living room. So, you know, it just brings me back to how important community partnership is. And that's why the story is so meaningful is because if it was not for a partner agency in town that was helping her with something else. They're the ones that came to me and said, just so you know, she has two folding chairs in her living room and that's it. I mean, the rest of the house was pretty much furnished. So that was fine. But um, so I just felt terrible that, you know, she hadn't opened up about that. So of course we did the referral. And then again, with community partnership, you know, she's single mother, disabled, two young kids. So she didn't really have a way to afford the truck or you know, get the, the, the stuff physically moved in. So the mission movers organization and act in were able. So just between household goods and this other organization and mission movers and myself, it was like, we got them a living room, you know? So it was just, I remember that one. Cause it just took, it was, you know, a lot of hands in the pot sometimes is a good thing. Yeah. That's terrific. Thank you, Peter. Do you, do you have a story or an anecdote? Yeah. Like um, I have many stories, but <laughs> when they were speaking, there was just one that 
stuck out for me. I had a client who had been on the waiting list for housing for very many years, and she even gave up. But one thing that she was so committed to is that whenever they requested for a document, she would reach out to the agency. And she got to the point where she thought she felt that most of her important documents were safe with her advocate. And so she gave them to me in a file and she was like, keep them somewhere in a locker. I'll always give you a call whenever I need them. And so when she got to this apartment, it was one of the conditions she had been given if she was to be reunited with her kids. She had two kids. And so we looked up for resources and we could not find because she didn't have a job. And, you know, furniture is very expensive and you're working with people who have gone through trauma, but they also don't have finances at the point. So I told her, I know of a resource somewhere, but I have to, you know, like get in touch with them. And then I will let you know if they let us go. And that's how I reached out to Household Goods. And then we came. Uh, I came with the U-Haul. She had zero, but when we left, it was all full. I, I'm sure they probably have that picture somewhere <laughs> in, your, uh, in your archives. Mm -hmm. And when we came, she was so worried. She was like, will I even find what I need? I told her, let's go. You never know what could happen. And then when we got there, the reception that she got from the volunteers alone was just, it changed like her whole mood. I started seeing the brightness on her face and she picked everything she needed. And this was towards Christmas. And while we were leaving, she was very happy and she was like, I can't believe I'm going to have my first Christmas with my kids after a very long time, you know? So when I just looked at the happiness she had and all the items she had got at no cost, zero cost, you know, for me that was so life changing. And I, I just said, sometimes we look at certain things and take them lightly because we're in a certain place, but there's someone who is just looking for that small thing. That's that's really beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And the little things really seem like it, seem like they can make a difference. And we do hear a lot from um, our our agency representatives about exactly our volunteers and how our volunteers really make clients feel. They come in anxious, and they 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 un they get the feeling whether it's from the volunteers themselves or by the way things are presented um, that they sort of they get a sense of ease as they as they go around the the showroom. Have you have you found that Amanda or Louisa? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've accompanied, um, not not the majority, but I've accompanied uh, accompanied some um, to shop, and I also used to volunteer there many years ago, and I'm always very impressed. Just very welcoming, um, and also just easy to work with. From, you know, um, in terms of making the referrals, and if I have questions or there's a difficulty finding a date just always really easy and welcoming to work with. So I always appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I think we might've lost Peter. Hopefully he'll find his way back to us. I, uh, I am oh, back, yeah. sorry. Yeah. There you are. I don't know why my computer kicked me out. But... Oh no, okay. Yeah. Well, you're back. And yeah. I don't know if you finished what you were saying, but what you were saying was, was very helpful. We really appreciate that that story and that, um, that insight. Um, if there was, um, Elisa, if there's one thing that you'd like us to know about the people that you serve or there that I, I feel like at our end, we often have, you know, kind of preconceived notions about, you know, it's just, we're trying to just have to be given, be, be able to give nice stuff to people that need it, but we don't really get the, some of the challenges that you're dealing with. And I'm just wondering if there's any thing you'd like to tell the people that are on the call tonight about, or do you like them to know about you know your work and the people that you serve as as far as far as we continue to do our work? Um, what would you say? Sure. Well, I want to share something before I, I I answer that. Um, that I'm very careful about who I refer to this program. Uh, you know, um, I'm not gonna say that. You know, I'm very careful. I'm gonna leave it there. Like yeah. I want to make sure that the family that I refer is a family that I in real need. You know, sometimes the families come to you and like, I oh, know I'm struggling and they have like a, the last Toyota, I don't know, 2000, <laughs> you know, 24 with like 
very expensive. So I'm very careful about that. I I know everybody everybody has their priorities, and I'm no no one to judge. You know, family decisions. They know their story. I don't know their all their their story. I know what they want me to know. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm very very careful. Uh, the other thing that I want to share is that. There are other organizations that kind of do what you guys do. I'm not gonna say names, but then you know, I was like donating my things, and 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 I see a lot of my neighbors donating things over there. And then when I asked them to serve, like, oh, this family, you know, newcomers, they have nothing, you know, they are struggling. They are like, well, mm -mm, a lot of you know barriers, and they almost ask you for like the dog like birth certificate, like they ask you all this bunch of documentation, statements, banks, you know, and your organization is so different, right? Yeah. That's why I'm encouraging like all my friends when they are moving, like my aunt, she moved recently to Florida and I told my cousin, go over there, please. Because <clears throat> when I when I fill out the form, you just ask me name for number when you want to come. That's it, you know? So that's what, I'm, what made this, you know, organization different, special, and with a real goal, you know, mm -hmm. to serve the families. Mm -hmm. um, I saw multiple times that I donate things and, you know, after that families need to buy it, need to pay for those things mm -hmm. that I'm giving for free. I know that they have, you know, other or, other structure. I respect that. But then one more time when I go and, hey, can you help me with this family? They are, well, I need this. Mm -hmm. Tiring. Are we so, we try very careful. We we try very hard just to. Um, we know that you 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 are you and your colleagues and and all these other organizations that we work with are the people that really know these mm -hmm. people. And you know we don't we feel like it's not necessary to then require yeah. any additional proof and documentation. We just understand that if you represent that this is a family that's truly in need, that's all we that's good enough for us. Yeah. Yeah, that's and, very appreciated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 the the other thing is that, um, it you know I'm I'm gonna take the opportunity to to tell you that these kind of programs are life changing, uh, not just because of 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 the comfort that you know th that furniture brings to the home, it's just one more time the hope you know that mom that was depressed that didn't want to work that was like you know crying all the time now she has this beautiful home you know the, she has furniture she has a bed their kids her kids have beds so she feels like motivated and now she's looking for a job that mm -hmm. happens a lot um on the other hand uh you know when you ask me about my clients like i i as i mentioned feature is very diverse uh but i noticed that a lot of families come from trauma uh, right now, as I mentioned, there is like a, an immigration crisis. We are all aware, all aware, and you know, I work with families that literally walk to the United States like for months, and they, you know, see bodies coming down the river. You know, they see grown ups uh, like raping kids. It's it's devastating the things that I hear, but you know, they are finding their path. And um, one more time, I, I have a couple of families that have been placed in an apartment. And, you know, because I work with different organizations, it's not always me, the one that made their referral. But um, I work with the Spanish American Center. I work, I work with MOG. And, you know, we, we make sure that, you know, we always, when, when we need it, we all together reach out um, to your organization. Because one more time, that, that, that that place that they are gonna call home is gonna open opportunities for them, you know. So thank you. I That's, wanted to share that. Appreciate that you're sharing that. Um, so Amanda, is there anything, um, any misconceptions that people might have about the people that you serve, or you know, Atkins a wealthy community, and, and you know, is, et cetera? <laughs> Yeah, it's true. I think there is uh, definite misconceptions that um, they're are not people struggling with an actin and there there there's a lot and that's an increasing population um and i would also say there's a misconception about people who live in subsidized housing and um it really is the most diverse group of people i've been around it's you know so many cultures and 
people from here, people that have come here as refugees, people that are immigrants but have been here a long time, um, a lot of English speakers, some that are not. It's just disabled, seniors, families. It's such a wide range of people. And at the end of the day, they're really just like their people. You know, I can relate to all of them. And um, there's something that we can always find to relate to people, even if they're going through challenging situations. So I do think there's a lot of misconceptions, but for the most part, they're hardworking, good people. And they're just, you know, it's just life is very expensive right now and it's tough to, to get by. Thank you for that. Peter, yeah. are, you, are you on the call? I can't see you on yeah. the Okay, great. Um, the question I'd had, I think you might've been off briefly. It was just, um, are there any kind of misconceptions people might have about the, the population that you serve or or assumptions that we might be making on our end that you'd like us to know about so we can better better serve your clients? I mean, yeah, in addition to what my colleagues have said, I think one of them is that sometimes people think that when people know that there are places you can go to and get things for free, they get lazy and they would not want to work, which is not true. The reason as to why the people we serve are in those positions is because they have just been disadvantaged by life. They have gone through certain experiences that have disempowered them and taken everything that they had. And so they are just trying to pick up themselves. You know, there's a quote that when you're drowning, you want people to swim towards you, to save you. But in most cases, society tries to swim away from them. And so what makes them you know, like drown more are those misconceptions. So I would say that they are not lazy, like people say, it's not that they just want to get free stuff, but they are struggling, they are in need. And by the time we decide to make a referral, you know, it is because we've interacted with them, we know them and understand them better. And we know that they need these services. I would never write to you and say, I need this, this and that if I knew that the person didn't need it. So misconceptions are there, but at the end of the day, we are looking at the human being, like, you know. Uh, thank you so much. That's that's really good to hear. Um, it's really just good insight. I've learned so much tonight. Um, so it's about 10 till eight, and I just wanted to leave a few minutes open for anyone that might have um, a question um, for any or all of our panelists. Um, everyone's really appreciated um, all the empathy and care and respect you have for your clients. And we're all we're all inspired, says Mary Bassett, our, our corporate counsel. Um, are there any yeah. questions? You can either raise your hand or put it in the chat. Anyone? I have a question, Miss Mimi. Okay. Um, what's the item uh, that you guys uh, like uh, need the most? Like the, the one that go faster and, and you need to replace all the time? I'm gonna turn that over to Sharon to answer that question. Um, that's a great question. The things that are the hardest to keep up with are the things that people use every day. So for the smaller items, things like lamps, towels, sheets, dishes, silverware, glasses, you know, all of those things. Um, and then for furniture, it's the most essential items, beds, couches, dining tables, and dressers. And so everything. <laughs> <laughs> the, thing, right. the things that people use every day. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah, okay. you know, just to give an example, last year we gave out 3,000 mattresses. Um, and probably about 8,000 small, um, you know, 8,000 tables, big and small. So we need a lot of volume to keep okay. up. With you. And that's good messaging for everyone on the call. I also have a, a question. Okay, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, uh, so I know that when you, when, some, when we do a referral, someone is allowed to come in, I think, once and take stuff. Is this like for life or is there a certain period when they can always come back? Like if anything happened, I am asking because sometimes there are many things that are unexpected. For example, if I referred someone because of DV and they got their apartment furnished and then a fire happened and Louisa was working with them and then she did the referral 
And when you put their name in the system, it shows, oh, this person was here and they got help. Like, are there some considerations that you make? Yes. Yes. Cases, so or is it written as well? Yeah. Yeah, so typically it is one visit. If there is a situation like that where somebody came and then they had a fire, we would certainly, you know, be able to make an exception. And that's something that we can put in the referral, you can, you know, put the understanding that you know they were here and this is this extraordinary circumstance. So to please consider a um an exception. Um Mimi, I see a question in the chat. Sorry. Um uh, oh, okay. Um do families with children get any priorities in obtaining housing? And do families get the to choose the communities in which they obtain housing? It's a good question. Um, on behalf of the Housing Authority, I'll answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, so no, families do not get priority for family housing because they have children because everyone on that wait list, not, okay, not everybody, um, most um because you can be a family without minor children but no you don't get priority for that um you get priority based on um the town you live or work in and you get priority if you're an emergency an emergency is typically something like um you're fleeing a domestic violence situation you're homeless and living in a shelter or something like that um, different scenarios, but they have to be vetted and, of course, documented, um, which can be tricky at times. Um, and was there another part of that question, or that was that was it? They do not they get a priority. The community in which they obtain housing. Do they have any choice over the where they? Yeah. So yeah. So currently, I can only speak for the town of Acton and our wait list. So Acton doesn't have federal public housing. We only have state public housing for families. So for the state public housing application, which is called the CHAMP application, it's a centralized application. So one application for the state, and they can check off any town where they wish to apply, and it will put them on those individual wait lists. Okay. And the, so the 30,000 people on the wait list that you mentioned, that was that just for Acton or is that statewide? That is for our wait list. That's for Acton? That's for Acton, Acton. yeah. It's it's broken down between family state public housing, senior and disabled state public housing, and HVP vouchers, which is a voucher program similar to Section 8, but it's a state voucher instead of federal. Yes. Wow. Um, so, Louisa, um, one of our board members says that the number one thing we need is mattresses. He just wants to underline that. <laughs> and we did start a program a couple of years ago called fund to bed where people can donate specifically to that program and we can buy uh, beds in volume at a uh, lower cost than you would average, you would go to a, you know, a, a mattress store to, to right. get. So that's been an important uh, piece of our mattress inventory. A mattress is such a, a personal item and we're very careful about not giving out anything with rips and stains, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's, that's the most important thing. Uh, Karen is asking, what happens if a client can't afford uh, transportation to household goods? Sharon, you want to answer that one? <laughs> or is anyone else? <laughs> yeah, what do you guys do when your clients can't afford okay. transportation? I will speak on behalf of our agency. So every client or survivor is attached or assigned to an advocate. And in most cases, our agency will pay for either a U-Haul or the means of transportation that they will need. But there have also been circumstances where if you have a truck and you can help them out, why not? You know. So my agency pays for the transportation, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, I can for in terms of the Acton Housing Authority, we have zero funds to help people with something like that. So what we do, what I do is get in touch with Mission Movers, an organization in Acton that, as you know, um, can help people sometimes move for no cost. And, and Karen, to answer your question also, um, we, have a, we have a limited um, transportation assistance program at Household Goods. So if 
people are really are completely out of resources and need right. everything. Um, they can apply, make a special separate application for transportation assistance. And Sharon and um, other members of the team work really hard to try to arrange low cost movers or moving two or three, uh, three or four clients at the same time, or try to find ways to make that happen. Give give truck vouchers. And we're still sort of ironing out that program because you know we're finding that the even even with that, I think I'd like you guys to maybe speak to this. What um, your clients' situations sort of keep changing, right? So even if we can arrange something, many times a client sort of disappears or you know um, has a change of circumstance or or something like that. Um, is it diff is it really difficult to work with your population? in that regard, as far as keeping in touch with them and keeping them on track? For, um, in my experience, no, but that's because by the time the clients get to me, their housing situation is stable. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. It happens with some of the clients that we work with because some of them are homeless and they are moving from one place to another. Mm -hmm. And there are others who are fleeing violence and so when they live in an area and it feels unsafe, they will move to a new location or they will have to change their phone numbers or something like that. Mm -hmm. But normally what we do, we give them our hotline, the number, and they're always free to call like anytime. It is easy to memorize, 800, 899, 4,000. <laughs> and so even if they changed, even if they changed their location or their numbers, at least they will have someone they can always call. But sometimes it becomes tricky, like someone will go silent for many months and then they will show up later and be like, hey, you know, I used to work with Peter and and then you get to reconnect. So those challenges are always there depending on what the clients are experiencing. But again, it is part of life. That's why like, we are very flexible like at my agency because we understand that when people go through traumatic events, sometimes it impairs the daily mm -hmm. functioning. So yeah, we always have plan B for that. If I am making a referral, for example, and we have a scheduled date, I make sure I keep following up at least every two days to make mm -hmm. sure it is going to happen so that if it is going to change, we don't want to miss that slot. Mm -hmm. So I'll communicate and say, oh, this client is not showing up because oh, of reason okay. ABCD can we reschedule. Thank you so much, Peter, for being so diligent about that. And um, you know, we are we are aware that so many of our clients come from so many different traumatic situations, and appreciate that as well. So it's it's good to be reminded of that. Um, so it's eight o'clock, and I promised everyone we'd be off the call by eight. Uh, um, but I just wanted to say this has all been so informative. Thank you all so much for everything you do. Uh, 